Thank you, John. It is a, a pleasure to be here. As John said, I was here a few years ago uh, lecturing on the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard during World War II. But some background uh, for this book, Whips to Walls. A few years ago, uh, as a 68-year-old graduate student at the University of New Hampshire, I found myself, that's, that's not funny. <laughs> <laughs> Not only was I older than all the students and all the professors, I was older than the fathers of the professors in most cases. <laughs> but uh, I found myself at the archives in Waltham, Massachusetts, researching for a dissertation, which eventually turned into that 32 and 44 book. Uh, and while I was there, I kept stumbling across references to a Thomas Mott Osborne, who was the warden at Portsmouth Naval Prison uh, during World War I. And as it turns out, Osborne is credited with conducting the most ambitious experiment in progressive prison reform. And when I say progressive prison reform, think open cells and prisoners guarding prisoners. But the most ambitious experiment in progressive prison reform ever, anywhere. And so after I got done with 32 and 44, I decided that I'd go back and do some more research on Osborne and, and write a book on him. And as so often happens when you start out with a book of very limited scope, why that eventually got expanded uh, not only from the Portsmouth prison during World War I, but back to the origin of the prison in 1908, and then back to the origin of the naval prison system in the late 1880s, and then back to the abolishment of flogging in 1850. And the theme of the book and the theme of the presentation today is the Navy's journey from a very harsh punishment system in the mid-19th century to one of the most lenient of punishment systems at Portsmouth Prison uh, during World War I. And there were a number of bumps uh, in that journey that, that we'll discuss today. Uh, so we'll go from flogging in 1850 to the Portsmouth Naval uh, Prison uh, during World War I. And I, uh, as I drove down here, I came through Portsmouth, Rhode Island, so I thought, well, I better explain that the Portsmouth prison I'm talking about is in New Hampshire <laughs> and, and not one that happens to be up the road in Portsmouth, Rhode Island. But those of you who aren't familiar with the prison, and I learned during the setup that my laser doesn't really work on this background here, so I'll be pointing at things. So those of you that aren't familiar with the prison, it's on the naval shipyard, which is on this island, uh, on the, in the Piscataqua River uh, between Portsmouth, Ma uh, New Hampshire and K Kittery, Maine. Uh, the prison has been closed since 1973. It's been vacant, inhabited only by bats and rats and miscellaneous other creatures, and it's gradually deteriorating. But it's, uh, it's going to be a long time before that structure falls down because it's a very formidable one. But as you can see, the only way you could get land access to the prison is by coming through the main gate or the other gate here and transiting the entire length of the shipyard. So the, the Navy is continuously trying to find a client for that building. But just the access to it is so difficult. And then it's laden with asbestos and lead paint and all sorts of other environmental hazards. So it's not going to have an occupant anytime in the near future. Uh, but that's the background for the prison. This is a close-up of it. It really does, uh, it's, it's a tourist curiosity. It draws a lot of attention to anybody that's, that is driving by, uh, by Portsmouth. And the prison that we'll be talking about during World War I is this wing and this tower. That was the original prison. These other buildings were constructed during uh, uh, World War II. So, I like to use this chart to uh, highlight the, the lecture for today and really for the book too. And I depict the naval discipline as a pendulum going from a very harsh punishment over here in the early 1850s to Osborne at Portsmouth. And as you can see, the pendulum started moving to the uh, left with the abolishment of flogging in 1850. And then the Navy was left with a discipline void. And, and I'll get into this, but flogging was a very efficient uh, punishment. 
And when that was abolished, why COs really didn't have other options at sea. To confine a, confine a sailor at sea was very difficult. There were, there were no prisons, and uh, there wasn't much liberty, and there was very little pay. So what was a CO supposed to do? They, they were really left with a disciplined void. So the pendulum gradually swings to the left. The Grogration here was abolished in 1862. That was a source of a lot of the Navy's discipline problems. So that helped. And then in the mid-1870s, uh, the Navy attempted to get Congress to fund a, a prison for them. Uh, the Army was successful getting Fort Leavenworth funded, and it was built in the early 1870s. So the Navy thought they might get their own prison. Uh, Congress wasn't about to fund a naval prison at that point, and uh, the Navy was sort of told to go away. And what they did is they developed their own makeshift prisons at Boston and Mare Island. They used an old granite warehouse at Boston Naval Shipyard and turned it into a prison. And at Mare Island, they had a Marine Corps uh, barracks jailhouse that they eventually turned into a prison. So they were makeshift prisons. And all of this, uh, well then in Portsmouth Prison, when these weren't working out too well, Portsmouth was built in 1908. And all of this was done under the influence of the progressive movement in the late 1800s. The progressive movement was taking uh, increasing uh, awareness of the poor and the unfortunate, and that also included prisoners. And Thomas Maud Osborne was very much a product of the progressive movement. And so uh, under the influence and uh, the strong support, from the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Jophesis Daniels, and the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Osborne was installed at Portsmouth Prison in, uh, in 1917. Uh, and we'll get into that in quite a bit of detail, but as so often happens, uh, when Osborne was replaced in 1920, why all of his liberal reforms were done away with, and there was an instant backlash, and the Navy uh, discipline pendulum started back in the other, the other direction. So, uh, going from flogging, uh, flogging was, as I said, a very efficient uh, punishment for the Navy. And it was uh, needed because the seamen at that time were really uh, a group of ruffians. Uh, they were more than likely uh, foreigners. Uh, they liked their grog ration and an occasional riot ashore, and so it took a very harsh discipline system to keep that, that group in line. There were various forms of flogging. This shows the seaman being bent over a cannon and administered his lashes. The lashes were administered uh, with the cat of nine tails, and supposedly the maximum number of lashes th that could, could be prescribed were 12 if you were a commanding officer, and a uh, hundred if you were guilty of an offense that required a court-martial. Now there, the most common punishment, and I did a lot of research on this, was 12 lashes. That was sort of a one-size-fits-all uh, punishment. But there were extremes. Uh, if there happened to be a number of ships in a harbor, they had a routine that was called uh, round the fleet, where they just passed the sailor the seamen from boat to boat, and there are some extreme examples where a sailor might get 300 lashes. Uh, you know, the Navy regs were there, but they weren't very well enforced. Now, it's hard to work humor into a lecture about uh, prisons and flogging, but I did find this cartoon of the master at arms bringing a cat with nine tails up topside uh, in preparation for the flogging. So, the argument for flogging, as I've said a couple times, were very efficient and very effective. And this is one officer's view of the need for flogging. And uh, my wife is here and she doesn't allow me to put up slides that have a lot of reading on them, but sometimes that, that's hard to avoid, so I do have a couple. Uh, one officer's view of flogging in 1840. Extra labor, ordinary confinement, solitary confinement, bread and water diet are plans that do not suit well on shipboard. Solitary confinement is not practicable on board ship. From the want of room, if cells were built in the hold for the purpose, they would take up space required for storage. Every man should be at all times at his post. This end would, be, would not be gained by throwing offenders into confinement. So as I indicated in, the, in that opening slide, 
uh, there really was a void uh, in the Navy as far as discipline was concerned with the abolishment of flogging. So, uh, in the late 1840s, Congress was trying to get around to abolishing flogging and they tried to build up their database to support that. So uh, COs uh, were required on a number of occasions to report the floggings on their ship back to Congress. And this is one uh, uh, flogging report that, that I went over among several. Uh, it involved 14 ships over two and a half months in 1848. And as you can see, there were a total of 446 floggings. So if you go back and do the math, that was something like uh, 32 floggings a ship. So every other day, somebody was getting flogged on a ship, on, on one of these 14 ships. And for what? Most often, drunkenness and all of these other offenses, which often were a subset of drunkenness. So the, uh, the daily grog in the Navy was certainly a big problem. But those were the type of offenses. And uh, as I said, uh, the seaman at the time was a rather rough uh, individual, and it took uh, flogging to keep him in line. Now, flogging was abolished in 1850. These two gentlemen, and this is a popular slide in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, where I've given this a couple times, because a couple Portsmouth lawyers were very much involved with getting flogging abolished. The first, Levi Wood, uh, Woodbury, was a Portsmouth lawyer, or later a governor and senator, but it was as Secretary of the Navy in 1831 that he initiated the earliest attempts at getting flogging uh, uh, absolved, but he also uh, offered, in a directive, he offered the seamen a chance to give up their grog ration uh, for pay. He would increase their pay if they gave up their grog ration. Uh, it was not very well received at all. As it turns out, well, not just because they liked their grog, but as it turned out, for the very minute, minimal offenses, uh, their grog ration could be taken away. So the seamen felt it was better to have a grog ration that might be taken away than the next step up, which would be a flogging topside. So uh, Woodbury's suggestion there didn't get very far. Uh, however, in the late 1840s, uh, uh, John Hale, who again was a representative of New Hampshire and a senator, uh, he introduced the first bill to abolish flogging in 1883, 1843. It didn't get very far. But then uh, in 1850, there was a, uh, an appropriations bill that somehow he tagged the abolishment of flogging onto this appropriations bill, and it passed by two votes. And it was almost like all of the uh, northern congressmen voted for the abolishment of flogging and all of the southern congressmen didn't. But under the influence of these two men, why flogging was abolished in 1850. Now, the abolishment of flogging left the Navy with insufficient penalties to enforce discipline. And here's one of the slides I used to put up that I'm not allowed to read to you, but let me go over this. Uh, the abolishment of flogging left the Navy with few, Navy, uh, few options. And there was a... Uh, a board put together under Commodore Charles Stort in 1851 to study the effect of the abolishments of flogging. And this is what his report had to say. We are therefore, in our opinion, without sufficient suitable penalties to enforce discipline of the Navy. Another one, strictly speaking, no summary punishment can be inflicted by a commander of a ship of war at sea. And finally, it cannot be doubted that the law in its present shape is insufficient and unsuited the service. So they were left with a big problem. And as I said, uh, there was very little pay, very little uh, liberty, and shipboard confinement was not effective at all. And discipline was inconsistently applied f through the fleet. Uh, punishments were suggested but really they were invoked according to the personal whims and prejudices of the COs. Yeah, something makes me think I should be reading. Yeah. Uh, as far as the COs go, this is what the COs had to say about confinement in 1851. Confinement is a trifling punishment. While they, the prisoners, enjoy a respite from work, innocent men actually suffer by
by having the onus of duty imposed upon them. Another, I have tried all kinds of punishment, and I feel it my duty to state that I do not think discipline can be maintained in our service unless by flogging. The attached punishment role is small, because in vessels of our tonnage while at sea, we could not spare the men from deck, and I have therefore been obliged to let many offenders pass unpunished. There is no place on a ship of war where a man can be confined for punishment without seriously injuring his health. So the COs were sort of at their wits end in 1851 with the uh, abolishment of, uh, of flogging. Now, the book is filled with examples of this uh, next issue about the inconsistent uh, invoking of punishments. And I've just picked this one example to show you. Uh, but if you happen to be on the uh, Monacacy in 1867 and you smuggled live liquor on board, you were confined in double irons for 10 days, you lost pay for five months, and you lost your liberty for one year. If you happen to be on the Shenandoah, they put you in irons for 48 hours. That's how inconsistent the punishments were in the fleet. However, on the Shenandoah, which happened to be in Japan at the time, for the punishment for, the, for furiously fighting and killing the Japanese, that was also double irons for 48 hours. So it was just all over the board. There was no consistency whatsoever. Uh, and not only couldn't you confine a seaman very effectively at sea, there were a very limited number of shore confinement cells. Uh, they had prison ships, they had uh, Marine Corps barrack jails, they had Navy Yard jailhouses, but it was just a potpourri of uh, confinement facilities. They really needed a prison. Naval discipline was chaotic, cells to shore were limited and scattered, a prison system was vitally needed. So, let me take you through this. Uh, one of the hazards of training an engineer to be an historian, I was an engineering duty officer, is that you end up with a lot of graphs and tables in your, in your history books. And uh, I've tried to cut back on the number for this presentation, but there are a few. This shows, the, the green is the number of enlisted personnel in the Navy and the Marine Corps between 1880 and 1939. The red is the number of Marines, the blue the number of enlisted sailors. So what I, what I want to show you here is back in 1875, when the Navy was first denied funding for a prison, Congress really wasn't even funding a Navy at that time. They weren't about to build a prison. So this goes along, and then in 1888, the Navy developed a need for a prison, uh, and they built the, uh, or built the two makeshift prisons at Boston and Mare Island. Camp Long, this was a Spanish prisoner of war camp on Seavey Island in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, the exact site where the Portsmouth prison stands now. So on the chart, this little bump here is for the Spanish-American War. And uh, Admiral Severa, uh, on July 3rd, 1888, uh, 1898, I think it was, was defeated at the Battle of Santiago. And like three or four weeks later, there were a couple thousand Spanish prisoners on, uh, on Seavey Island. And uh, turns out it was a very successful prisoner of war camp. And that, that led the Navy to see, uh, believe that maybe we ought to put a prison there. Portsmouth Prison was built in 1908, as you can see, uh, we're ramping up. And then there's this big boom for World War I, and that's when this Thomas Mott Osborne was at the Portsmouth Prison. Now, you might say that the population of the Navy and the Marine Corps isn't necessarily uh, a reason for an increased need for prison cells, but actually the desertion rate in the uh, Navy and Marine Corps was pretty consistent at about 10% through that whole period. <laughs> and uh, that was the prime need for, uh, for prison cells. So this is the Boston prison, uh, a converted uh, storehouse on the shipyard that was made into a prison in 1888. I took that prison, or picture myself just a few years ago. For those of you that haven't been up to the Boston shipyard, since they closed it and have renovated, it's just a beautiful area now. And so this prison uh, is now a uh, very attractive uh, uh, office building. 
with a plaque that commem commemorates its proud history of a naval prison at one time. The Mare Island prison, uh, this little structure here was the original prison that was built back in the early 1870s. And then both prisons struggled to keep up with the need for cells. And so the Boston prison expanded upward to the floors above and they built wings onto the Mare Island prison. Uh, just this week I was telling John that I've been working with the uh, Historical Society in Vallejo, California. A developer has uh, bought the land where the Mare Island shipyard was and now he wants to develop it and uh, the Heritage Commission out there is trying to save the original prison. So I, I wrote a letter to the mayor and a bunch of other people this week uh, highlighting historical importance of that prison and they are trying to save it. Uh, the Camp Long that I mentioned about on Seave Island, uh, the site of the future prison, there were 1,600 Spanish prisoners treated well. Uh, you, you read through the, uh, the archives and you just can't believe that we treated prisoners of war so well. Uh, the prisoners gained 10 or 15 pounds during the two months that they were at uh, Camp Long. Uh, officers had wine served at the mess. The hospitalized prisoners, and there's a hospital right next to the prison up there, why the women of Portsmouth and Kittery, Maine would come in uh, with flowers and cigarettes for the, the prisoners that were in the hospital. And as I mentioned, Admiral Severa actually got out and walked, walked the streets of Portsmouth. This is a picture of him wandering around the streets of Portsmouth, New Hampshire in August of 1898. These are prisoners bathing in the Piscataqua River and being well treated. Now, I mentioned that the experience at this prison, Camp Long, was so positive that it, it induced and, and, and enthused the Navy about building a prison on CV Island. Uh, the prisoners were there in July and August. Had the prisoners been in there December through February, they might not have been as enthused about building a prison on CV Island. But after that experience, uh, as I mentioned, the Boston prison had been overloaded, so they put a prison ship the South Three uh, in, in Portsmouth at, at the site where they were in the process of building the prison. And I found this post... John, what did I do? I ah, okay. Uh, I, I like the old days when you had a flip chart or a projector, and as long as you had a, another bulb, why everything was okay. <laughs> the, these things are a little scary. Uh, but this was a postcard uh, what it is showing, in, in 1905, in July of 1905, the biggest TNT explosion up to that time occurred to blow a point of land off of uh, the shipyard here, Henderson Point, to increase the uh, navigation of the Piscataqua River. But i just show you here that this postcard is from 1905. This is the prison in the background. They started to build it in 1903. In 1905, it looks like it's done, but it wasn't open until 1908 because they had trouble getting funding for it between uh, 1905 and 1908. This is what it looked like in uh, 1908, as I mentioned, just the main tower and the one wing. But the Navy finally got a real prison in 1908. They wanted a real prison because uh, the, the two they had in Boston and in Mare Island really weren't that intimidating and uh, this Alcatraz like structure is really an intimidating prison for uh, those of you that, that weren't there. <laughs> now this is a uh, postcard that one of the historians up at Portsmouth uh, passed on to me. Uh, you, you can't read it there but there was a young man from western Pennsylvania who was a prisoner at the prison in 1910 and he's writing his parents back in Allegheny uh, County, Pennsylvania and he's talking about getting home for Christmas. And, and the only reason I put this up is I mentioned the need for flogging because the seamen back in the early 19th century were such a group of ruffians and drunkards and foreigners and, and really tough. By 1910, the seamen had changed. There was a lot more recruitment in the Navy from the Midwest, and you were getting a lot of young men into the Navy who really didn't understand what they were getting into and more than likely they were running afoul of Navy regulations and so they were at the prison for having uh, uh, 
violated some uh, Navy regulation offense. The really hardcore criminals were moved then on through the prison into a state prison. And the, Concord, the prison at Concord, New Hampshire, uh, did have a lot of the hardened criminals. Now, about this time, I've got you up to the 1913 time frame, President Wilson and the progressives uh, moved into power. As it turns out, after Andrew Johnson was impeached, uh, about the end of the C Civil War, eight of the nine presidents prior to Wilson were Republicans. One of them, Grover Cleveland, uh, had two terms that were, were separated. Uh, and when Wilson came to power, uh, the Republicans had been in power for the last 16 years. And really the only reason the progressives got in was because Taft had been president and then Teddy Roosevelt wanted to run against him on the Bull Moose Party and so they split the vote and, and Wilson got in. So, but the progressives were very enthused about having uh, regained the presidency. And this is a picture of Wilson's cabinet. This is Wilson. This is uh, William Jenny Bryan, Secretary of State. Three times ran as a populist candidate for president, was an avowed pacifist, uh, and he uh, actually resigned as Secretary of the State after the Lusitania was sunk and, and Wilson had no choice but to start moving towards war. He resigned. This is Jophesus Daniels. Uh, just his head's there, but the, a lot of the naval officers suspected of him of being a pacifist too. Uh, this is Wilson. This is FDR standing over there. So uh, the prime uh, personalities now for the rest of the lecture and the rest of the book are Jophesus Daniels, uh, FDR and Thomas Maud Osborne. Uh, Jophesis Daniels uh, had absolutely no previous naval experience, had been a newspaper editor uh, for the Raleigh Observer down in North Carolina. He was a, uh, a fixture in the Democratic Party and had helped Wilson get elected. So his assignment as Secretary of Navy was reward uh, for that. He was a strong prohibitionist and celebrated when uh, uh, the, uh, the Prohibition era uh, started, I guess. Uh, he was an enlisted men's champion. He had many disagreements with, with naval officers. Uh, you might remember that it was his General Order 99 that abolished the, the wine mess uh, on the ships. He wasn't too popular of that. Uh, there was, he tried to change, I'm told, port and starboard to left and right. And he, he just, he, he, was, he was a problem. Uh, as John mentioned, he had some issues with Admiral Sims, and that, 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 that is not an understatement. Uh, I found these cartoons. Here's a picture of Daniels roasting Sims over a fire, and here's a picture of Sims shooting holes in Daniels' war record. Now, there were a, a number of issues between Sims and other senior naval officers and, and Daniels, not the least of which, as it turned out, uh, Sims accused Daniels of uh, avoiding preparations for war in World War I. Uh, Wilson campaigned under the heading of, he kept us out of war. And so Sims maintained that Daniels put off the Navy's preparations for war in order to get Wilson reelected. And as a result of that delay, why... Uh, Tens or hundreds of thousands of lives were lost and billions of dollars were, uh, were ex expended. Uh, this turned into eventually a congressional inquiry and it was really a, a big deal. But the point I want to make here is that there were a number of issues between Jophesis Daniels and the senior naval officers in Portsmouth Prison and Thomas Maud Osborne was really a subset of that, that whole environment. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and I like to show this because we usually see pictures of him struggling to get up to the podium or in his wheelchair, and in this time frame, he was a, a very young, a very energetic, a very ambitious, a very handsome, uh, a very athletic individual. He graduated from Harvard in 1903, married Eleanor in 05. He was a New York State Senator from 1910 to 1913, and that's the connection between he and Osborne. Osborne was also into New York politics. They both fought Tammany Hall, and uh, that's where their relationship started. He ended up being a VP candidate in 1920, which is the tail end of the era that we're talking about. So, another one of my graphs, but I've gotten you up to the 1913-1914 time frame, and now I'm going to take you through 1920. What this shows 
is where the naval prisoners were confined between 1940 and 1920. Uh, had your choice of Portsmouth, that prison ship, the Southry, Pear Island, Island, the Mare Island, or the Cavite prison, the Boston prison was closed in 1913. But I draw your attention to the fact that Portsmouth and Southry here dominate this whole, whole chart. And the message being that if Daniels and FDR and the progressives really wanted to implement a progressive prison reform program, there's no doubt that Portsmouth was the place to do it. And that's what they did. Uh, they brought in this guy, Thomas Maud Osborne. He came from uh, a family of abolitionists, women's rights activists, and as I said earlier, uh, he was really a product of the progressive area, era. He was a New York politician. He had been the warden at Sing Sing Prison immediately prior to coming to, uh, to Portsmouth. Uh, at, Warden, at, 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 at Sing Sing, he left amidst a bunch of scandals and problems with the senior politicians in the state, including the governor. Uh, there were accusations of uh, rampant homosexuality at the prison, uh, poor prison administration. He really left under a cloud. But he was a prison reformer, and uh, Roosevelt knew him, and that was his link to Portsmouth. They made him uh, a lieutenant commander in the United States Navy. He didn't even know what the Navy was. And, and Daniels and, and FDR made him a lieutenant commander in the United States Navy. He was 62 years old. So he was older than the commandant at the shipyard. He was probably twice as old as the lieutenant commanders. And he thought he knew more than all of them put together. He had that type of a personality. So here you got this 62-year-old lieutenant commander at Portsmouth Prison running things, and uh, he's always wanted to run his own show. He was a weird duck. He, uh, he loved disguises. Uh, before he became the warden at uh, Sing Sing Prison, he uh, went in in prisoner's garb just to uh, see what was going on. He did the same thing with a, another gentleman at the Portsmouth Prison before he took over there. And there were other instances in his background where, where he did that. This shows him demonstrating a head cage uh, while he was warden at prison. He went to sea as Seaman Brown uh, just to see what a sailor's life was at, was at sea. And if you can read this, this is a, a picture that was sent to Jonathan Daniels. Jonathan Daniels was the son of Jophesus Daniels. That's the close link, link that they had. Uh, Osborne loved disguises. He was buried in a Portsmouth prisoner's uniform uh, when he died in uh, Albany, the suburb of Albany, New York. Uh, he had been to attend a, uh, a theater performance where his son was in, and he wanted to go in disguise, and he had whiskers and some things in his cheeks to puff out, his, and he died on the street, and people didn't know who he was. It took him a couple days to sort out that that was Thomas Maud Osborne. But that's the strange duck that he was. And just to build on this a little, uh, he, was, he was the head of the Hasty Pudding Club at Harvard when he was there. When he was at the Portsmouth Prison, he started a theater group, and they made presentations. He would get permission from Daniels or FDR for this group of prisoners to leave the shipyard and perform in Portsmouth or York, Maine, or over in Manchester, uh, New Hampshire. And this is just for 1999, or ni 1919, where these, uh, these groups performed at the Portsmouth Music Hall several times, York, and then over in Manchester on one occasion. Uh, so another graph, but the, to make this point, this shows uh, prisoners at the prison, restored, received, dishonorably discharged, what I want to draw your attention to is this one, restored to the Navy. Prior to Osborne's arrival, there were almost no restorations. After Osborne's departure, there were almost no restorations. While he was there, there were a phenomenal number of restorations, of sailors returned to the fleet. He was the prisoner's champion and the commandant's nightmare. His administration for the prison was known as the Mutual Welfare League, and as I indicated earlier, prisoners guarded prisoners. They did away with marine guards. Uh, they had prisoner judges and juries. They had open cells. It was just the most liberal prison environment you could possibly imagine. He had started this concept 
at the uh, uh, Sing Sing prison, and it got him in trouble there, and that carried over to Portsmouth prison. For one thing, he refused to separate prisoners. Navy regs uh, required that if a prisoner came to the naval prison and he was guilty of a criminal offense, robbery, murder, assault, why he was to be separated from all those prisoners that were guilty of military offenses. And more than likely, the criminals then would pass on and go over to the state prison. Uh, Osborne was of the mind that any prisoner that came to his prison started out on an equal footing and they could earn privileges uh, as a result of their good behavior at his prison. And th that wasn't what Navy Reg said, but that's the way Osborne ran his prison and that got him into trouble too. And as I mentioned, he formed theater groups. Uh, as far as the Commandant was concerned, and I've spent a lot of time in shipyards and I just can't imagine the disruptive force that this guy must have been in a shipyard where you were trying to build ships and submarines and repair war damage during World War I. Uh, he had absolutely no respect for the chain of command. He used his personal relationships with Daniels and FDR to work around the commandant and anybody else in his way in the chain of command. Uh, I found that at least during his period that he was at the, at the prison, which was like two and a half years or so, he made six visits to Washington, D.C. as a lieutenant commander to personally talk to the assistant secretary of the Navy or the assistant secretary of the Navy on problems that he had. So he had no respect for the change of command, no use for naval customs and traditions, and he just caused endless in-yard disputes. For example, and, and I found all of this in the, in the archives at uh, Ed Waltham, uh, I found memorandums between Osborne and the Commandant where Osborne was asking that his prisoners be given rifles so that they could conduct drills so that when they were restored they'd be ready to go back into the fleet and, and serve a good purpose. Now, he did have a PS that said we would take the firing pins out of the rifles, which I guess satisfied the Commandant a little. But just uh, the fact that he might request rifles. There were other examples where it was hot in the shipyard and he requested that his prisoners not be required to work if the temperature was above 90 degrees. Uh, on other occasions, he defended a prisoner's refusal to work in the rain. And these work parties that were out in the shipyard were just a source of endless debates. Uh, and not the least of which was Osborne absolutely despised the yard marines that were initially there to guard the prisoners and there was no end of uh, disputes between he and the, uh, the marine officer on the base. He was also an irritant to the fleet because too many marginal re uh, sailors were being returned to the fleet. Ad Admirals would write him letters asking him to solve a problem and these would be a short two paragraph letter and the admirals would get a four or five page letter back explaining to them why they were wrong. And that's generally not the way the Navy works, so it, it caused a lot of irritation. Uh, Admiral Sims, uh, his opinion of Portsmouth confinement, confinement. It was a nature of jest, a home so good prisoners would not even try to escape. Captain Tossig thought that fleet was being burdened with riffraff and immoral perverts. And a Rear Admiral Nimlock wrote, some prisoners prefer Portsmouth to sea duty. <laughs> so, gradually this filtered up the line with all these admirals asking, what the heck is going on at Portsmouth Prison? And there was a JAG investigation conducted during the latter half of 1919. It started off as a, 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 an investigation into a misappropriation of funds, but as the JAG investigation went on, it just became a horror story of homosexuality at the prison with the possible inclusion of Osborne himself. And so uh, w w or, uh, Daniels had no choice but to assign an investigation board and FDR insisted himself that he had that board. So he and two other admirals in January investigated Osborne at Portsmouth Prison and the report was that the previous JAG report, the board's report was, that the previous JAG report was superficial and perfunctory. They absolved Osborne of all blame. They praised the conditions at the prison. Uh, and that was in February. Uh, make a note here that the Providence Journal down this way was really, uh, couldn't have been more strongly anti-Daniels and anti-FDR. Uh, 
And uh, the editor, John Ratham, wrote often on uh, the shortcomings of Daniels and FDR, but he considered the, uh, uh, this board's report a total whitewash, the culmination of political chicanery. And Osborne resigned in March of 1920, just one month after the uh, investigation concluded. So he was absolved of all blame, but uh, he resigned. Now, I usually don't have this slide in the presentation when I give it be because I'm at the Newport Naval Station. I thought I'd include it because it's, it's included in the book. But there was a, uh, a sex scandal at the Newport Naval Station during these, these same months that all this investigation was going on in, at, at Portsmouth. Uh, in December of 1919, there was a controversial investigation into uh, homosexuality here at the Naval Station, and Daniels and FDR were accused of condoning the entrapment uh, plan that was put into effect to expose this, this ring of, uh, of homosexuals. And as a result, five Newport sailors were sentenced to Portsmouth for five to 30 years for homosexuality. Well. This uh, Ratham at uh, the Providence Journal again, that just put him all up in arms and he raised uh, all sorts of issues to the point that Wilson uh, directed another investigation of this investigation and once again uh, he absolved Daniels and FDR of all blame and, and Providence Journal considered it another whitewash. Now there was no end to this. Uh, later, this was in January 1920, uh, about the summer of 1920, FBR resigned, and then he ran as, and the vice president, as, as a vice president candidate the rest of that year, and this Newport sex scandal and the Portsmouth prison scandal were all, uh, it, they interrupted his, his campaign to say the least. And then once uh, uh, Cox and, and uh, uh, FDR lost and the Harding administration moved in, why uh, the Republicans reopened that investigation into the Newport sex scandal, and there was a different result. The methods were considered most deplorable and disgraceful. FDR's actions were considered most reprehensible. Got a lot of publicity at the time, but really uh, it gradually faded out, except for the fact that in September of 1921, the five Newport uh, sailors that were in the process of serving from five to 30 years at Portsmouth Prison uh, were released. I'm, I'm trying to create the environment of all this confusion and turmoil that existed between the Navy and, and Daniels and FDR during, during their tenure. In March of 1921, the Republicans uh, regained the presidency under Warren Hardy. Uh, Edwin Denby here uh, relieved Daniels. Denby enlisted into the Marine Corps when he was 42 years old. He was married and he weighed 260 pounds and he had to have waivers for all three of those. He entered as an enlisted man, rose to be a major, and uh, so he's the guy uh, that's replacing uh, Daniels and the liberals. So you might get the sense that whatever was going on at Portsmouth Prison wasn't going to go on much longer under this uh, ex-Marine. Uh, and he appointed a Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel Hamilton South as CO of the Portsmouth Prison. So, as I earlier chart, as soon as South got in, everything, all the liberal reforms were thrown out. Uh, he immediately abolished the Mutual Welfare League, the theater groups were no more, uh, no more baseball teams, none of that good stuff. Immediately increased guards, police in the work parties, consequences of uh, misbehavior. Was absolutely and totally intolerant of homosexual prisoners. And he re reduced restorations to a trickle. So the naval discipline pendulum that had swung from very severe to very lenient now started back in the other direction. Uh, now... This is just, because I've been asked several times what happened after that. This shows the population, no, I'm sorry. This shows prisoners restored during Osborne's tenure, the percentages of. So in 1919, over 50%, almost 60% of the prisoners that were received at Portsmouth were returned to the fleet. And as you saw, a lot of the fleet officers considered that 
riffraff and, and moral perverts. But I, 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 th this sort of depicts the wave of progressive prison reform that swept through the prison at that time. This is the chart that shows what happened at the prison uh, after uh, Osborne left, actually from 1929 to 48. You can see the, th this is the population uh, at the prison, the prisons, prisoners confined. The, pr the prison was just a shadow of its former self until the Second World War when it took all these prisoners on board again. What year is that long one, the real long one? The real long one there is 3,000. No, oh, the year, uh, 1945, 45. right at the end of the war. So th this is another book. I, I don't have much details on that, but, but you can see that uh, it resumed. Now, what is important is during this period, earlier I was showing you that, that Osborne had maybe a couple thousand prisoners. There were more, the, uh, from the picture that I showed you earlier, the prison was greatly expanded in World War II. So they had far more prisoners confined there during World War II, but they didn't restore anywhere near as many as Osborne restored during, uh, during World War I. So, in summary, the naval prison system evolved after flogging was abolished in 1850. Uh, Portsmouth Prison became the crown jewel of the naval prison system. Osborne's experiment at Portsmouth Prison during the war was the high water mark of progressive prison reform. And it was the fleet's disapproval of Osborne's methods and restoration practices that resulted in an immediate backlash upon his departure. departure. So that's all I have for you. Yeah, right on schedule this afternoon. I'll take questions. Yes, sir. I heard no mention of the use of bread and water. Well, they used to lay that on. That was uh, during that period that I mentioned where they were, were struggling to find uh, other punishments after flogging. Uh, I mentioned some of a uh, couple ships in irons there. Yeah, they might be in irons on bread and water. That was a, a pretty common punishment, to say the least. Yes, sir. Two questions. Uh, where, what is the facility of the archive in Waltham? And the other one is this Levi Woodbury. Yes. He was a, a senator and also secretary of the Navy at the same time? Oh, no, no, no. He was governor. He was, he was a senator before he was Secretary of the Navy. Why, did my, was my slide confusing? I thought it said... I'll go back and check that. I thought it did, I don't... Now, your first question was... In Waltham, you said you got data. What's the facility? Oh, uh, yeah, it's, it's the New England Regional uh, National Archives. It, it's a wealth of uh, uh, data. Where, not, not just for the Naval Shipyard, for, for all of New England. Where in Waltham is it? <laughs> well, I, I know you go down 95 and get off and go a couple lights. I, I'm not that familiar <laughs> I'm not that familiar with uh, with Waltham but uh, just like everything if, if you Google NARA National Archives Regional Agency I think it is Waltham Massachusetts that uh, it'll give you the address. Thank you. It's, yes sir. The impact of flogging uh, did it create welts in the skin or to kill the flesh? Did the, did oh, the, yeah, ab absolutely. You could kill somebody flogging them. Uh, now, how they treated it, I, I don't know, but I, I've seen some horrible drawings, not pictures, of uh, uh, the impact of flogging. The, the, oh, yes. Ab oh, I, I, that, I'm glad you asked that. Because I showed the, the cat of nine tails, the cat of nine tails is, is really a, a whip with nine strands of leather with lead pallets embedded uh, into the strands of leather. So those hurt, <laughs> no, no doubt about it. Yes, sir. Uh, flogging <coughs> abolished in 1850. Uh, do you know if it was reinstated in the Confederate Navy? I found nothing that indicated that it was reinstated in the Confederate Navy. Uh, along those lines, uh, it was abolished in the U.S. Army in 1812. It took the Navy many more years to get around to it. It was abolished in the British Navy uh, before, before we abolished it. We were one of the last to abolish it. Yes, sir. Did you uh, come across any statistical data about flogging being abolished and then any, a spike in offenses punished? You know, they, some of the uh, quotes you had said that, oh. you know, they, it was tough to, to deal with punishments or things were going unpunished, but did the, the loss of the deterrent actually increase the number of offenses? Yeah, uh, uh, the, the answer is yes, and I, I can't give you the data on it, but I can give you 
w one example, there, there's, I can't remember the name of the ship, but there was a mutiny. As, as soon as the f sailors found out that they couldn't be flogged anymore, why, they all deserted, you know. Uh, and, 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 uh, now, I wish I could remember the name of the ship, but I can't. But, but it, uh, there was no doubt that there were, there were repercussions from it. And I showed you the statements from the COs that say, hey, we've lost control. There, there's really nothing we can do. I'm not even uh, 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 punishing offenders anymore because I, I've got no means to do it. Yes, sir. Oh, in the back. Oh, I found it interesting that the, the daily grog ration was, was done away with in 1862, right in the middle of the Civil War. <coughs> That's true. Were any of the, the people involved in, in that with uh, people that we knew? Or, uh, uh, I, I can't attach any. And also, did, did the same thing happen in the Confederate movement? Uh, I haven't done the research. I'd be guessing if I told you. I don't honestly know about the Confederate Navy. But the grog ration, when, when a flogging was abolished in 1850, well, I indicated to you that from as early as 1830, Congress was trying to do something with the grog ration. And in 1850, when they abolished flogging, there were initiatives then to do away with the grog, but they thought that was really too much to lay on them at, at the same time. So I don't think it was so much a matter of some champions coming forth to get the grog ration uh, 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 absolved. It's just that the pressure finally built up and then when the Civil War started they figured well okay th we, we can do it at this time. But I can't give you any personalities that, that led that effort. <coughs> yes sir. In the Merchant Marine during the sailing ship ending they used to uh, inflict the w their uh, disagreement immediately. <coughs> the first mate was the toughest guy on the ship and if you gave him any lip he'd come back with no teeth. <laughs> and, uh, well, this is pretty effective punishment. <laughs> in addition to that, they had the punishment with their keel hull. Oh. They put a line under the vessel. I, I've I've heard that and I was looking forward to finding some examples of keel hauling somewhere in the archives and I never did. Uh, I, I can't give you any examples of keel hauling in the United States Navy, but again, there were abuses of flogging. I'm sure there were abuses of other other disciplines. Mm. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, can you uh, tell us something about the decision was made to close the prison? How did that come about? Well, uh, any interesting stuff about that? Yeah, I see that. This always happens to me. My period of expertise is up to 1920, and then everybody wants to know about what happened at the prison since then, and I'm not as schooled on that. Uh, and it's even more embarrassing because I was at the shipyard as a junior officer in 1973 when it closed. Uh, but I can just remember the directive uh, coming down. Uh, cost was involved, uh, and they they had had a, a dip in the prisoner population again. So I think it was, they, they could accommodate the needs that they had for cells as at something far less than the elaborate prison that they had at the time. Uh, about the best I can do. Yes? When, when a guy was flogged um, and it was finished, did, was he left to heal on his own or was he actually yeah. treated? Oh no, that's, they, he was treated by his friends. Uh, he, w he wasn't left there to die by no stretch of the imagination, and they'd put brine on his wounds or something, but it, uh, uh, yeah, he, he, w he was treated as best they could, but how, ca how effectively can you treat a guy if you're on the Asiatic station somewhere and, and somebody beats you with a whip, you know? There's, there's not much they can do for you. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much for your attention.